Hi, this is Jeb Blunt, and welcome to another 15-minute webinar. On this episode, we're talking about sales stories, and I have with me Paul Smith. He's the author of this amazing new book. You can see I've, I've already wrinkled this book. I've read it so many times. It's fantastic. I've marked the pages. I'm highlighting things. I love this book, Sell with Stories. It's a book you have to get if you love sales. Welcome, Paul. Well, thanks very much. Glad to, glad to be here. And I guess uh, for folks that aren't familiar with you, you yet, so this is Jeb Blunt, author of Fanatical Prospecting, and along with a number of other books that I'm only now uh, becoming aware of. Uh, so I, I'm, I'm a bit behind you. I think this is my third book, and you're on six, seven, or eight or something. I'm right, right, right in the middle of writing number eight. And and I promise you I'll be using this as a reference. A uh, new book's called Sales EQ, and stories go along well with that. Uh, this book is so rich and there's so many pieces. So we're, we're going to change the format just a bit. Usually I give a tip, you give a tip. In this case, I think you're going to give all the tips. And, <laughs> okay. and I, 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 I want to start off with a simple question. And that is, why are stories so powerful in sales? Yeah, well, I think they're, they're powerful in all kinds of purposes, but maybe especially sales. And it's because the truth is, in sales, you're trying to change somebody's opinion about something or their behavior, namely to get them to buy something. And it, it turns out, and I guess it's most of the cognitive science that's been done in the last couple of decades tells us that human beings don't make rational, logical decisions only, right? The truth is we make emotional, subconscious, sometimes irrational decisions in one place in our brain, and then we justify that decision logically and rationally later in some other place in our brain, like a half a second later. So we think that we came up with this terribly rational decision, but the truth is we, we didn't. You know, we, we say we bought that fancy red sports car because it had great resale value, but the truth is we just feel sexy in it, right? And, and you, it's just difficult to tap into that part of the brain when all you're talking about are facts and logic and reason. You need that too, but if you want to tap into that part of the brain, you need emotion, and stories are really an emotion delivery vehicle. So that's really the, the best reason to use it. Well, I think you're, I think you're onto something. You know, we, we always say, you know, people buy on emotion, justify with logic and uh, layering onto that people buy for their reasons, not your reasons. And we sometimes talk to them about our reasons, which may be emotional, but to them sound like logic and they can't pay attention to that. The, the other thing I think is important about stories is that people remember them. Like, you know, if, you, if you're telling people a list of bullet points, they can't remember that. But if you are wrapping them into a story, they walk away and it means something to them. It, one of the things that that salespeople always bring to the table when they're talking to me, when I'm out giving speeches, working with them is, you know, how do I close? What are some closing techniques? What what do I do to get people to buy from me? And in your book, you talk about um, closing and the sales process and how stories help salespeople build stronger closes or move people to that place where they're ready to, to take action. Talk about that and what advice you have for salespeople in the closing process for using stories to get that person to say yes. Yeah, so th this was one of the surprising things to me in, in doing the research for the book. So I, I ended up interviewing salespeople at, at 50 or 60 different companies around the world. Um, and fortunately for me, I, I didn't just interview salespeople. I interviewed buyers, professional procurement people, right? Because who better to tell you what sales stories work and don't work than the buyers who make the decisions. And I did not expect to find storytelling happening in the, in the closing part of the sales process. I've totally expected it to be in the rapport building and when you're just meeting them. I expected it be, to be in the main sales pitch even resolving objections, you know, and even negotiating price, I, I could see my way to storytelling. But closing the sale, I just had this preconceived notion that that was just a, a, a hard kind of thing that salespeople just magically knew how to do. And I had no idea how to do. And I just didn't expect storytelling to be part of it. But what I found was that uh, there, there are several stories, but one of them that I think was the most uh, genius really was creating a sense of urgency. And, and the, the several salespeople I talked to that did this really well uh, they used it when they got to the point where they'd essentially made the sale and their buyer was saying, yes, I need this. I want this. Yours is the best. I can afford it. It's in my budget. But now is not the right time. And the sales story that they told at that point was a story to help them understand why if you wait, here are the bad things that are going to happen. But they didn't just say, if you wait, here are the bad things that are going to happen because that's just a list again and it's not going to be that effective. What they did is they told them a story about one of their other clients or sometimes their non-clients, people that had gotten to that point in the sales process before and then didn't buy, and then six months later 
regretted it. And they were able to tell them, you know, through the story, if they had bought when I told them to buy, none of these bad things would have happened to them. Now they're, they regret it. Now, actually, they can't buy it because now they can't afford it because they've lost their budget or they've, or they've gotten fired or all the, whatever these bad things that have happened and they just really regret it. So if now's not the right time, that's fine. But know that you're taking a risk <laughs> and here are the risks that you're taking. Well, I think that you just hit on something that's real, real important for salespeople to get. And there's a couple of pieces here. So let's start with the first piece. The first piece is you were amazed that you know stories are happening at the closing and not necessarily happening at the very beginning of sales. And this is true because where salespeople often open up the sales process is at logic. So they're way up here at logic mm-hmm. and where the, the buyer is, is at emotion. And then as the the seller moves through the process, they move and become more emotional and the buyer is moving to be more logical. And so we're, we're missing each other along the way. And, and that's why I believe storytelling and we call it bridging in our sales process. But I believe that you've got to be constantly walking through, talking about stories, helping your, your buyer see things from their perspective, making things relevant to them and contextual for them and weaving stories in sort of the fabric of that process so that it makes it easier for the buyer to make that decision. Now, the second thing that you brought up, and I think this is really, really, really important for most salespeople to understand is that the biggest objection you're going to get is status quo. In other words, you're asking me to make a decision, and it's easier for me to put that off than to actually do it. Right. So if you don't minimize status quo, and what you explain in the story is I'm, I'm telling you all the bad things that are happening. I'm not telling you they're wrong, you're wrong. I'm saying these are the consequences of your failure to make a decision. I begin to minimize your objection or your reason for not doing business with me, which is mostly status quo. It's easier to stay with what I'm doing versus to change. But as you minimize that, you begin showing them that there are a lot of compelling reasons for them to make the decision. And I love that you use the word urgency because urgency is a big deal in sales, especially if the buyer doesn't have to do anything. Right. Yeah. And you know, the, the, the other one that really surprised me in that closing process was, um, was one that one, one salesperson called coaching the breakup. I don't know if you've gotten to that point in the book yet, but that one just, it was just fascinating because it turns out a lot of, buyers, they've got a relationship with the salespeople that they've been doing business with for years sometimes. And if they were to take you on as a new uh, salesperson selling product X, they've got to get rid of this other person. And that's hard. And and he likened it to, you know, breaking up with a, a girlfriend or a boyfriend in high school. I mean, it's just hard to do. It's hard to be on the receiving end of that. And it's hard to be on the delivering end of that. And so one of the stories that, that he tells is how other clients of his have successfully broken up with their current supplier in a comfortable way and made room for the new supplier in a way that was emotionally acceptable and wasn't so difficult. And again, he didn't just say, well, you got to do this and say this and say this. He's like, let me tell you what my last five clients did when we got to this point and they just couldn't stand to make that phone call to fire their current supplier. Here's what each of them did. That's just a, 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 a way to use stories at that point that I wouldn't have seen coming either. A lot of competitors, especially if I'm walking in and I know there's a bad situation and I'm c- trying to create a compelling reason for them to do business with me and I get past the status quo, but I know what the competitor is going to do. I know the, the, the song and dance. I know they're going to make the person feel guilty. They're going to do those things. They're going to play you know, that relationship off of them. And I love you call it coaching the breakup because I, you know, that's not what I always called it. But what I would basically do is say when they come in, you know, here's what my other clients have experienced. They're going to do this. They're going to say this. They're going to do this. They're going to do this. And by setting that up in advance, when they came in and acted out exactly the same way that I described, it became easier for my buyer to be cold to that and make that decision versus you know, feeling sorry for them and what have you. And, and this is a big deal. We, we're, I, my, my CFO of my company right now is struggling with that because she wanted to fire one of our vendors and now we're doing business with both vendors because she couldn't pull the trigger right. because they gave her enough, they made her feel guilty enough, I guess, about that and they right. didn't have a good enough breakup story. What's the difference between telling a story about you, yourself, a personal story about what you've experienced or telling a story about someone else and their experience in the abstract. What's the difference between those two stories and how do you apply those in different situations? Yeah, well, you can use both those kinds of stories and you should, by the way. Um, 
I mean, what would you think of somebody who every story that they told was about themselves? Yeah, you would you would think they were just always talking about themselves, which would make them boring and your brain would turn off. Yeah, and, and I would say not only boring, but arrogant. I mean, like, who wants to, to work with somebody who's the center of their own attention all the time, right? So you need to have stories about other people or you you will be that person, right? So you got to have both kinds in your repertoire. And and as I lay out in the book, the, 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 the places for stories happen everywhere from when you're introducing yourself to a prospect, to building rapport with them, to the actual sales pitch itself, to to resolving objections and, and uh, negotiating price, closing the sale, even after closing the sale, you know, when you're just trying to build loyalty and customer relationship management. And, and what I lay out in the book is 25 different stories that every salesperson needs to have. And they fit in one of those places in the sales you know, process. But at any of those, the story could be about you or it could be about somebody else. It's more likely when you're introducing yourself to the client that you're going to tell a story about yourself because you kind of need to get to know them. Um, and maybe later on when you're in the sales pitch itself, it's more likely that you'll be telling one about another client or a competitor or something. But you can use both types of stories at any of those. So, Paul, as salespeople are walking through the sales process, where are the places where stories have the most impact? I mean, I think we know that all through this process, everywhere you go, a story is going to connect better than a bullet point. Yep. But where in particular, if we're giving salespeople advice on a 15-minute webinar, do we tell them this is where you really need to be leveraging stories? Yeah. So probably the first one is in that, that rapport building part of the sales process. So you've already met your prospect, but now you're trying to build rapport with them. So this is where you tell stories about personal stories about you so they can get to know you. Because I, I think you know, a story is the shortest distance between a stranger and a friend, right? So that's how you book, you build a relationship very quickly. And so those are stories about you and about your company so they can get to know both of you pretty well. The second one I would say, and this, this hopefully is the most obvious one, but during the actual sales pitch itself. So that's where you tell stories like, the, I call it the problem story. So this is where you're telling a story about somebody who's got the problem that your product or service fixes. And so that you're, you're prospect then can see, oh, oh yeah, I've got that problem too. Uh, so therefore I need what you're selling, right? So that that's a classic place. And, and you most people are probably doing that already. They'll get some tips on how to do it better in the book, but that's probably the, the, the most often used part. And then we mentioned earlier about closing the sale, not, not one I would have expected, but that's obviously, I would guess the most critical part of any sales call is you've got to close the sale. Um, so, so those stories to close the sale there as well, if I had to pick three areas. Now, one thing that, that I teach salespeople is that stories have to be relevant and they have to be, um, they have to mean something to, to the buyer. And I believe that, you know, it's, it's important that we tell stories in the buyer's language. And there's a lot of reasons for that, but we go back to the brain. Our brains have a tendency to be more comfortable with, uh, people that are inside of our bubble of familiarity, and when we tell stories in the in the prospect or buyer's language, they feel more comfortable with us and they're more open to us. Mm -hmm. And and so one of the stories that you have to tell, especially when you're talking about solutions, is you have to tell stories about things that haven't happened yet. So you have to tell future stories. So I'm I'm walking you through the process. You told me your problems. I'm saying to you, listen, you know, I heard you. You've got this problem here, and here's you know here's what I recommend, and here's what's going to happen. I mean, here are the benefits, and here are the wonderful things that are going to happen to you, and in. And I find a lot of salespeople doing is they're basically doing that, but they're just pitching their own stuff, their own features and benefits mm -hmm. versus creating a visual story or a visual um, emotion about for the buyer of what's going to happen once they take those steps. And I'm wondering your advice on telling stories about about things that haven't happened yet, the future. Yeah, so that, that's that's a, a great one to use. In in uh, in my first book on storytelling for leadership, I have a whole chapter on vision stories. But and salespeople obviously can use those as well. It's a very powerful way to help your audience see your vision of the future, as opposed to saying, you know, another list of here's what I want the future to be like. Here's what a day in your life will be like in the future. And for salespeople, that might look like uh, after you've told the problem story, you get to tell the solution story. So if here's what your next year will look like if you have my product or service, and it won't be like the problem story, it'll be much better. And so that becomes a future story. But you, you said specifically relevance, and I think that's a, a key point. In fact, 
if you look at any kind of story, whether it's a, a romance novel or a Hollywood movie or the sales stories or leadership stories, all stories, there's, there's probably three things that make a great story a great story. And, and, and you probably know what they are. It's a hero we care about, a villain we're afraid of, and an epic struggle between them, right? I mean, think of Star Wars, right? You got your Darth Vader, you've got your Luke Skywalker, you've got your struggle between them, right? And, and, and that's a little bit Hollywood. If you're to translate that into business language, the hero we care about becomes a hero that we can relate to, right? The, the, the struggle uh, is, is still a struggle, but the, that obstacle is um, uh, a relevant obstacle, right? It's not, it's not a villain we're afraid of necessarily, but it's the kind of obstacle that your listener, the buyer, is likely to run into in their day. So absolutely, the hero, the villain, and the struggle have to be relevant to the person you're talking to. I like that. Very good. And that we, um, the way we, you know, put those together for, for salespeople when they're giving presentations is you you articulate the problem or challenge. Uh, you walk through a recommendation, the hero, like the problem or challenge is the villain, the hero. And then the plan result is, um, is the outcome on the other side. So the, the hero made good. And it's got to be all about the prospect. It's got to be using their language, their jargon to, so that they interact with you in a way that, connects them to the story that you're telling right how important is it for your prospect to be telling you stories oh very in fact there's a whole chapter in the book just on how to get your buyer to tell you stories in fact and i've got that early on because i think and you would probably agree with me your first objective when you're in a, an early meeting with a buyer is to get them to tell you stories because if you don't how will you know which of your stories to tell them <laughs> Right, you've got to figure out what their problems are, and so there's there's advice in the book for how to get them to tell you stories, not just give you answers. Right, you can ask them what's your biggest problem, and they could tell you, um, you know, an inefficient warehouse. That's my biggest problem. Well, that may not help you a lot, but if you can get them to tell you a story about how the last time they had an emergency order from a customer, they had to, uh, they couldn't find it in the warehouse and they had to run a special production schedule and then ship it to them express mail and it cost a lot of money. And then they found the product in the warehouse right where it was supposed to be all along and they, they didn't have to go through any of that expense. I mean, now they've told you a story and now you know what the problem is you're dealing with. So now you know what solution to sell them. But if they just say, if, if you just ask them a question and they tell you inefficient warehouse, that's not as helpful as a story. So that begins with asking both strategic and artful questions, artful questions to get people to taste or strategic questions so that you are creating what that next step is going to be because you are running along a sales process. And where I find salespeople make the biggest mistakes with getting their prospects to tell stories is that they begin to interject their story in the middle of their prospect story. And as soon as you know their mouth starts moving, their ears turn off, and so right. does the prospect. So, so listening has a lot to do with getting people to tell stories. Yeah. So my, my three pieces of advice for getting your buyer to tell you stories. Number one is shut up and listen, <laughs> right? Uh, you know, uh, a conversation abhors silence like nature abhors a vacuum, right? And so if, if you can't shut your mouth, <laughs> you're not going to get them to talk. So that's number one. But number two is ask open-ended questions instead of close-ended questions. So specifically ask people, you know, tell me about a time when you knew your biggest problem was your biggest problem. Tell me about that moment when it became clear to you that this is my biggest problem. Don't just ask them what their biggest problem is. That's a yes, no, close-ended question. You know, the third one is, and, if, and that's only if these two strike out, the third one is you tell the kind of story that you want to hear, right? If I tell you a story about my kids playing football, you're going to tell me a story about your kids playing football, right? So if I tell you a problem about I'm having with my computer, you're going to tell me a problem about a problem you're having with your computer, right? So you, you lead by example you, and you actually tell a story. Don't just give a list. So, but again, that's after you've tried the other two. Yeah. One of the, the ways I ask those questions is I'll say, you know, a lot of my customers are experiencing this, 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 and this, you know, tell me what you're experiencing or tell me what trends you're seeing in the marketplace. So you get them talking about that using someone else's situation to get them there. There's, there's another thing that you said that I don't want to gloss over. You said that as they tell you their story, they begin to reveal what their real problems are. I'm paraphrasing you just a little bit. 
Yeah. The thing that salespeople don't always get is that people communicate in stories. You communicate in stories. I communicate in stories. Your prospect communicates in stories. Some people tell books. Some people tell paragraphs. But we typically communicate in stories, and they're not always linear stories. Sometimes they start in the middle of the of the plot. But inside those stories are all of the things that you need to know in order to close the deal, in order to shape your next story. And salespeople who don't pay attention to that because their brain is thinking about the next thing they're going to say miss the clues. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And this is a big deal because people that you're selling to, especially in the B2B world, are using someone else's money to solve their problem. So as you started walking through, you know, I had this happen to me and then this happened to me and then I run into this and I had this happen on this stress and this issue and then my boss yelled at me. That's the problem. And if you tell stories about how you solve that problem for other people, it becomes really almost impossible for them not to do business with you. Yeah, yeah, I agree. But it starts with you listening and getting them to tell you their stories. But I will give you a, a, a quick piece of advice. It's something that I see uh, storytellers, including salespeople, do wrong all the time. And it's the way they start their story. And most people make this commit this cardinal sin. Never apologize or ask permission to tell a story. right? Uh-huh. And you've seen this happen all the time. Two people will be in a meeting or 10 people in a conference room. Somebody will raise their hand and say, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but uh, can I just tell a quick story? I promise it'll just take a minute. Right. What does that communicate to the rest of the audience about how important you think the story is? What would you say? I would say it makes you look like an idiot. I mean, it's um, if you if you're apologizing for doing that, you're saying the story's not worthwhile right. and uh, and it's not going to be interesting. It's going to bore you to death. And as soon as you say that, when we go back to the brain, you tell the brain to turn off. Exactly. The next yeah. 10 minutes are going to be a waste of your time. Don't pay attention. to this. Right. Leaders don't ask permission to lead. They just lead. Right. Salespeople never apologize for doing your job, right? So never ask permission or apologize for telling a story. Just tell it. I, I'm grinning because I, I I think if you read Fanalco Prospecting, don't apologize for calling somebody up and interrupting their day. Just do it. It's right. your job. That's, That's your great job. advice. Yeah, never apologize or ask permission to do your job. Right? Just do it. In fact, I would tell people, go one step further. While you're not apologizing and not asking permission to tell a story, don't even tell people that you're going to tell them a story, right? Because what's the, what's the first thing you think of if I say, so Jeb, um, let me tell you a story, right? I mean, like you're not a kindergartner. You don't need to be told you're going to be told a story. In fact, that turns most people off, right? Don't use the S word. Just tell people the story without announcing that you're going to tell a story. There's and there's a there's a, another layer to that as well, and it's it, it disrupts expectations. Mm-hmm. What most people expect out of salespeople are pitches and bullet points, right. blah 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 blah. And when you open your mouth and you start weaving a story, they're not expecting that. As soon as you disrupt expectations, the brain says, "Oh, this is important," and you pull them towards you versus pushing them away. Right. But if you tell them you're going to tell the story, what they think is, oh, here comes the sales pitch. <laughs> or, exactly. or here comes a lie. I mean, that's what my mom used to, you know, she would tell me, Paul, you don't stop telling stories. I'm going to come whoop your behind. Right. I mean, you know, they, they use the word story as a, a synonym for something untrue. Right. So don't set your audience up for that misapprehension about what you're about to do. Just start telling your story. Paul Smith, you are amazing. You're, we're definitely going to do this again. Sell with a Story is a book that you have to get. And uh, Paul, tell us where people can get the book and where they can reach you. Yeah, thanks. So uh, the, the book should be on Amazon and at your local bookstore uh, by the time you're seeing this. And uh, they can find me at www.leadwithastory.com. Awesome. Thank you so much. Thank you.